So we've alluded to in the other things about this small sample, big sample issue. We don't have a hard, fast rule with binary data like we do with continuous data. It's not so simple as declaring a cutoff sample size of 60 and saying when we have samples 60 or greater, do this versus 60 or less, do this slightly different thing. It's a slippery scale with binary data, and we're never going to force you to choose whether you have a small or large sample situation. But I am going to make you aware of what can be done in small samples where we don't quite have the luxury of the central limit theorem kicking in. And there's something called Fisher's exact test, which is actually always applicable, but used to be only used in small sample situations because it was it's very computationally intensive, and only till recently could computers do it relatively easily. So let's go back to our HIV transmission AZT example. And just to refresh your memory, here's the data from the study we were analyzing. From a hypothesis testing perspective, testing the equality of the two population proportions from the two samples, and for the null that they're equal versus the alternative that they're not equal, is what we want to do. And we showed how to do that with the chi-squared approach. The chi-squared approach through the two-sample z-test. They're both based on the central limit theorem kicking in, which requires bigger such samples. Both results are approximate, but are excellent approximations if the sample sizes are large. They give the same p-values that more computer-intensive exact methods would do. But they don't do as well in smaller samples. Fisher's exact test, on the other hand, is always appropriate to test the equality of few proportions. But the calculations are difficult, and they're computationally intensive, with the degree of intensity increasing with sample sizes. So they didn't used to be able to be performed by computers, except in the smallest situations. They give exact p-values. There's no central limit theorem-based approximation, and there's no minimum sample size requirements. Let me try and give you the rationale between how Fisher's exact tests work. It's very cool, and it's a cool thing to think about, but you can already see how it could be computationally difficult. Suppose the null is true. P1 equals P2. In our example, suppose there's no association between AZT and maternal infant HIV transmission. So across both groups, there were 363 infants and 53 of them across both groups were infected with HIV. So imagine putting 53 red balls representing the 53 HIV-infected children and 310 blue balls representing the 310 non-infected children into a jar. Now shake that jar up as much as you can. What we're going to do is shake it, shake it, shake it, and then we're going to close our eyes and, ran, and pick out 180 balls. And that will represent our AZT group, as there were 180 children born to mothers taking AZT. What we're calculating with Fisher's exact test is if we had taken that jar, shaken it up, and then randomly taken 180 balls out of it, we calculate the probability of getting 13 or fewer red balls among the 180. That represents our one-sided p-value for Fisher's exact test. The two-sided p-value is just about, but not quite exactly, twice the one-sided value p-value. And it accounts for getting a really large number of red balls in the AZT group that would be less likely than 13 as well. But here's the idea. When you shake that jar up, you're making the null true. By putting 53 red balls and 310 blue balls in, you're not even separating out the two groups. You're just assuming that there's one big group where 53 out of 363 had the disease. But then you shake it up so you equally distribute that. You've got a jar that's what you would expect if the null were true. And then what you're doing is picking out your, you know, the idea of the sample we got of the AZT group would be the idea of getting that sample to the null were true would be picking 180 balls out of this jar. And what we want to know is how likely under that scenario would it be to get 13 or fewer red balls. Here's how you do it, though, with Stata. So is your head spinning yet to think about how to do that? It's a really kind of, it's a cool process, but it would be impossible to do by hand unless you had a lot of time. Well, we can get it from the CSI command. All we have to do at add at the end of the command is the option exact which stands for Fisher's exact. And we get the exact same output that we did before, but at the bottom, instead of giving the chi-squared result, it actually gives us the Fisher's exact result. And you can see here that both the one-sided and two-sided values are very small as well. 
they're both 0.001 is given by state. And our chi-squared was on that order of magnitude as well. So here they don't give us anything different. This is a large sample situation by the sort of loose criteria to find in lecture three. And the approximate methods that we can do by hand should agree with Fisher's exact. Let me show you another application, though, that's smaller sample application. We're only dealing with 65 pregnant women, all who are classified as ha having a high risk of pregnancy-induced hypertension. These women were recruited to participate in a study of the effects of aspirin on hypertension. These women are randomized to receive either 100 milligrams of aspirin daily or a placebo during their third trimester of pregnancy. And here are the results from this study. In the aspirin group, 34 of the 65 women were randomized to the aspirin group. Four of the 34 ended up with pregnancy-induced hypertension. Of the 31 women randomized to the placebo group, 11 ended up with pregnancy-induced hypertension. So this is a sample proportion in the aspirin group of 12% compared to 35% with pregnancy-induced hypertension in the placebo group. By our criteria for smaller or larger samples, we look at the product of n times p hat times 1 minus p hat for each of the groups. And here that product is 3.6 and 7.1 for the aspirin and placebo, respectively. And the lower these are, they're going to be positive numbers, but the smaller these are, the smaller the sample is in terms of whether or not the central limit theorem will kick in. So these are small samples, relatively speaking. And again, I don't want you to worry so much about this detail or calculating. I'm just trying to remind you that smallness versus largeness with binary outcomes is defined by the split of yeses and nos in addition to the overall sample size. So if we ran the CSI command with the exact option, you see that our two-sided Fisher's exact p-value for testing for the equality of proportions between these two groups versus the alternative that a different underlying proportion of women get pregnancy and induced hypertension. It's statistically significant at the 0.05 level that two-sided p-value is 0.038. And I'll leave you to actually get to the real story, which would involve looking at the risk difference and its confidence interval as well and think about how you might report this to somebody else. If we did the chi-squared, you see the two-sided p-value is 0.0234. It's slightly lower than um, the Fisher's exact test p-value. And the reason there's a discrepancy here is because this is a smaller sample. Now, truthfully, in a lot of situations, this was what happens. We get different values for the chi-squared and for the Fisher's exact, but they don't lead us to a different decision. But there are rare situations where one will be significant, usually the chi-squared, and the Fisher's exact will not be. And then reviewers get skittish about this, and they worry about properly using Fisher's exact test, and they think sometimes that people try and get in under the wire by using the chi-square test, quote-unquote, inappropriately in smaller samples. But in most situations, quite frankly, it's not going to make a difference in your inference. So a safe thing to do in all situations, since it's computing is cheap now, would be to use Fisher's exact test because it's easy for the computer to do. Now, in these small samples, the 95% confidence interval that I just asked you to think about, it's substantive utility. What it stated gives you is still based on P1 hat minus 2 P hat plus or minus 2 estimated standard error. So it's still based on that central limit theorem-based approximation that we said may break down a little bit in smaller samples. There's no correction for this that we can easily do. So from a working standpoint, even if you have a smaller sample or think you do, and run the appropriate hypothesis test, Fisher's exact, the best you can do to try and quantify the uncertainty and the difference in proportions is to report this one based on the central limit theorem approach. It'll give you at least a ballpark range and help try and understand how much uncertainty there is in the difference, even if the confidence interval isn't exactly correct. So just to summarize, how do we compare proportions between independent populations? Well, to get a p-value, the two samples z-test or chi-squared test works better in bigger samples and will match the results of Fisher's exact test. But Fisher's exact test is always appropriate regardless of the size of our samples. To create a 95% confidence interval regardless of the size of our samples, the best we can do is what we've been doing. Take the observed difference in proportions and add or subtract two standard errors. Great for bigger samples and can be used as a guideline in smaller samples.
Not quite correct in smaller samples, but will give you a good sense of width and range in the sea eye. So from your perspective, anything I give you, it's okay to do this. And it's okay to use Fisher's exact test to get a p-value or even the chi-squared. So don't worry so much about what's big and what's small. Just recognize Fisher's exact test as another approach to comparing proportions. And know that we don't have a small sample correction for creating a confidence interval on the difference in proportions.